This video was made possible by patrons like Dean C. Thanks, Dean. And if you sign up to the Patreon now, you can get an exclusive TLDR lanyard absolutely free. Find out more at the end of this video. The Conservatives have been in power for a while now, more than 10 years, winning a plurality in four consecutive elections. You might think that the public will be getting bored by this point, but polling suggests they're not, with the Tories polling actually improving lately. So, while we are a fair way away from the next elections, unless Johnson chooses to call it early, it's still worth considering the future and running through three reasons why the Conservatives might win the next election, holding on to power yet longer. Now, two disclaimers before we start. Firstly, these three reasons aren't meant to be an exhaustive list. There's lots of other reasons that the Conservatives might win, and lots of other reasons they might lose. These are just three reasons that we found interesting. Secondly, and this sort of follows on from the first point, this isn't intended to be a prediction. We're not saying the Conservatives will win or that we want them to, just that these factors could end up helping them. With those three factors being the Conservatives' incumbency advantage, the splintered left vote, and what we're going to call the Unionist Scotland problem. So let's start with the incumbency advantage. In general, an incumbency advantage describes the electoral advantage enjoyed by the party or politician in office that derives merely from the fact that they're currently in office. A classic example of this is name recognition. If an incumbent and a challenger are running for office, the incumbent will likely have higher name recognition among the electorate, because for the whole of the last term, the incumbent will have been the one on TV talking about their policies and what they've been doing while the challenger can only say what they would have done differently. And, well, what actually happened is a lot more interesting and gets a lot more airtime than what would have happened. By the time the next election comes round, the Conservatives will have been in office for well over a decade, which means they've got some serious incumbency advantages. Name recognition is an obvious example. Boris Johnson has been permanently on the news over the last year, while Starmer has struggled to get any proper airtime. The gap is even more glaring when you look at the cabinet. According to YouGov, 94% of Brits recognise Chancellor Rishi Sunak, while just 33% recognise Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor. The same is true for Priti Patel, with 95% recognition, versus just 21% for Nick Thomas Simmons. The same is true for Sajid Javid at 77%, compared to his shadow counterpart, Jonathan Ashworth, at just 38%. Now, obviously name recognition isn't always a good thing. Joseph Stalin's name recognition is pretty high and for all the wrong reasons, but most of the time it's an electoral advantage. A study from Nottingham University found that, on average, incumbent MPs enjoy an extra 2% of the vote. Another notable data point is this year's local elections, where Labour did pretty badly across England, but remarkably well in Wales, where they were incumbents, and their first minister regularly appeared in the media alongside the Covid efforts. Name recognition isn't the only incumbency advantage, though. The Conservatives are also planning on scrapping the Fixed-Term Parliament Act, brought in by the Coalition Government back in 2011. It's not central to the point, so we're not going to go on about it in too much detail here, but the Fixed Term Parliament Act was supposed to limit the power of Prime Ministers to call elections, essentially by passing this power to the Parliament. Unfortunately, the Act was also responsible for the parliamentary deadlock we saw back in 2019 during the Brexit debate, which is why the Conservatives have decided to scrap it. Regardless, this means that the power to call elections will return to the Prime Minister, and that's a significant incumbency advantage, because it means that Boris Johnson, or whoever the Conservative leader is, can just call an election whenever it suits them electorally. Johnson could basically just wait for a jump in his approval ratings, and then call an election immediately. The final incumbency advantage worth mentioning is what we'll call central government leverage. Essentially, the Conservatives can use the power of the central government to incentivise voters to choose Conservative candidates in their local elections, with the London mayoral election being a good example. Despite the fact that all of TfL's financial woes were induced by the pandemic, as we explain in this video, Johnson took the opportunity to blame Khan for financial mismanagement and only provided funding for TfL on the condition that Khan raised fares and the congestion charge. 
Any politically engaged Londoner would have realised that if Khan was replaced with a Conservative candidate, Sean Bailey, then there would have been no problems getting the appropriate funding, and they wouldn't have to pay higher fares or higher congestion charge. Another example of this is the £3.6 billion Towns Fund, which was supposed to be shared between 101 left-behind areas. Under the scheme, towns were able to bid for up to £25 million each. The first 40 of these were chosen algorithmically, with the remaining 61 chosen by Housing Secretary Robert Jenrick and his junior minister Jake Berry. And this led to some interesting results, because despite civil servants ranking it as only the 270th most deprived area in the country, well outside of the top 101, the ministers decided that Newark should receive the full £25 million in funding, and also allocated some funding to Darwin, which, according to the government's 2019 deprivation index, is even less deprived than Newark. The punchline here is that Robert Jenrick is the NP for Newark, and Jake Berry for Rosendale and Darwin. A similar thing again happened with the Community Renewal Fund, a £220 million package meant to replace EU funding for 100 deprived areas. It seems like, again, the funding has disproportionately gone to Conservative and electorally relevant Red Wall seats, and when the government were pressed on this, they refused to reveal their allocation calculations. Essentially though, if you live in a Conservative seat, it looks that you're more likely to get funding. Now we should say that this is nothing new, it's just how politics works, but it's a definite incumbent advantage, regardless of which party is in power. Beyond incumbent advantages, the second reason that the Conservatives are likely to win is the splintered left vote. Essentially, the left-wing vote in the UK is split between Labour, the Greens, and to a lesser extent Lib Dems, while the Conservatives have done a far better job of consolidating the right-wing vote in the UK. In the UK's first-past-the-post system, this makes it exceptionally difficult for those on the left wing to beat the Conservatives, who are basically guaranteed a victory if the right get more than 40% of the vote nationally. This is both because Labour have been pretty useless at squeezing out other left-wing parties, and because the Conservatives have been very good at squeezing out right-wing ones. The best example of this is the Conservatives successfully squeezing out UKIP and the Brexit party by becoming passionate Brexiteers, cutting foreign aid, and getting tough on immigration. There are two qualifications here. Firstly, there's always tactical voting, which is when left-wing voters concentrate on a single party to maximise their chances of beating the Conservatives, even if that party wouldn't have been their first choice left-wing party. And as voters' party loyalty falls, tactical voting has become more and more popular, as was notable in the two most recent by-elections. The second qualification is the Lib Dems. Post-Brexit, the Lib Dems were competing with Labour and the Greens for left-wing Remain voters. However, with Brexit now pretty much over, it's possible the Lib Dems will end up competing for the centre-right vote too, as they've done historically. This happened in the Cheshire and Amersham by-election, when the Lib Dems managed to win by converting centre-right Conservative voters. Nonetheless, tactical voting and the Lib Dems aside, the Conservatives do seem to have done a better job of cornering their vote than Labour have done. And finally, the third reason is the unionist power problem. Essentially, it's hard to see how Labour could possibly win an outright majority at the next election, in part because Labour can no longer rely on Scotland. This means that in practice, Labour will most likely have to rely on the SNP for a parliamentary majority. And the problem is, it's hard to see how the SNP would sign up to any coalition without insisting on a second independence referendum, which means that voting for Labour could indirectly increase the chances of Scottish independence. This is something the Conservatives played on in 2015, with this infamous campaign poster depicting Ed Miliband in Alex Salmon's pocket. This means that Labour will have to work hard to convince voters that they're not only better than the Conservatives, but they're so much better that it's worth risking independence for. This isn't an easy sell for many people, and you can expect the Conservatives to play on it in the next election. Now, obviously, this won't necessarily be a problem, because either A. Labour could win a majority in England and Wales, or B. The SNP vote could collapse, but neither of these things look particularly likely. So, as long as the Conservatives are doing well in England, and the SNP are doing well in Scotland, Labour are pretty stuck. 
These then are the three main reasons why the Tories are likely to win at the next election, and maybe the one after that too. Labour are clearly in a tough spot, one, depending on who you ask, not necessarily helped by Keir Starmer and the party's current approach. But what do you think? Will the Tories win yet again, and could Starmer and Labour do anything to stop them? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. As I said at the start of the video, we're running a Patreon promotion whereby every patron paying more than $5 a month gets an absolutely free, never for sale lanyard. To claim yours, just sign up to the TLDR Patreon and then click the link to the store. Signing up not only snags you a lanyard, but also gets you a whole host of other perks, including early access to videos, exclusive live events, merch discounts, and more. Find out what you can get and sign up by clicking the link in the description. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.